Once a giant, always a giant. For me, it's only a giant. What's going on YouTube, Diggy 546 Definitely hit that subscribe button if you're new. Like the video if you like the video. And I won't tell if you click that bell. But let's go ahead and get into this. So this video is very different than usual. I wanted to dive into statistics and analytics and football, more specifically football, but this applies to pretty much every sport as well as news that you watch. These days we live in a world where numbers give credibility to opinions. We, we come up with an opinion and we look for the numbers to support our opinion. The thing is that stats are there to tell a story and you can use statistics to tell any story that you want to tell. There are a number of ways that you can consume statistics in sports. To keep it simple, I'll divide it into three categories. Objective stats, those are yards, touchdowns, catches. Subjective stats, those will be drops, tackles, and quarterback hurries. The reason I call those stats subjective is because you can have two people in on a tackle. Sometimes the third person that's in on that tackle doesn't get credit, sometimes they do. It's very inconsistent, and it's just something that you notice. Drops, sometimes different sites have different numbers for drops. Sometimes they blame the drop on the quarterback. And then lastly, uh, quarterback hurries. Those are subjective because how do we know if they're hurrying the quarterback? We don't necessarily have a defined uniform way to measure quarterback hurries. Those things are all subjective. So those spots will be, those stats will be different depending on which site you see. And then the third thing is translated stats. Pass block win rate, bad throw percentage, player grading, and a ton of sites do player grades. A ton of stats have statistics like this where they're inferring what that player's responsibility was on that particular play. And we cannot do that. Uh, pass block win rate. You cannot determine if they won that pass rep or not. You really can't. And then you have to determine what is winning a pass rate. If the player gave up a little bit of pressure, but he kept his quarterback clean, did he win that play or did he lose that play? These three different levels of stats are pretty much how we infer from a very, you know, set in stone statistic like yards, touchdowns, catches. And even those stats aren't just there aren't just end all be all stats. They don't tell the entire story. Yards can come a ton of different ways. A quarterback can have a great game, not have many yards, not have many touchdowns. A receiver can impact the game hugely and only have two or three catches. So the next thing I want to step into is how these statistics can influence the way you see sports, the way you see your favorite players, the way you see your favorite teams. This first image I have right here is most first rounders in the common era by school. Now this is a draft stat. I think this was posted last year by NFL Network or one of the major networks. And you see that USC has 69 players in the common era that have gone in the first round of the NFL draft. Now that's more than any other team, right? But how much more? USC is double the size of any other school on this draft. And this image makes a difference of five players seem like a difference of over 20 or 30 players. So scales of graphs are one way that the news, the media, anyone who's presenting you any statistic can make it look like it's more than it is or less than it is. And now let's get even more specific. Let's take Patrick Mahomes, for example. When Mahomes throws the ball less than 30 times, he is 9-1. His record is 9-1 when he throws the ball less than 30 times. So one can use this statistic and say, how about if you want to win the game, you make him throw more than 30 times? Or if the Chiefs want to win games, make sure that he throws the ball less than 30 times because he's 9-1 when that happens, right? Well, this disregards that he's 17-1 as a starter when he throws it more than 40 times. And then this also disregards the fact that he's only lost eight games in his entire career in the regular season. So I can cherry pick statistics to push whatever narrative I want. I can say that him throwing it more than 40 times is automatically going to win you a game. But I can also say that him throwing it less than 30 times will win you the game. You can use these statistics to tell whatever story you want. All you have to do is look hard enough. So in order to evaluate any kind of statistic, I think you have to ask these questions. What is this measuring? How is the data collected? And is the stat presented in a way 
that tells the whole story of what happened on that particular play or during that game. And the third option is the most important. If it doesn't tell you an accurate representation of what you saw during the game or what most people saw during the game, then that statistic is irrelevant. It's only a piece of the puzzle. Now let's look at something like completion percentage. Drew Brees has consistently been towards the top of the NFL in completion percentage. And by that reason, some call him the most accurate quarterback in NFL history because he's routinely over 70%. Even his last two years where he seemed to have regressed, he's still over 70%. The thing is, if you're throwing in an offense where you're throwing more short passes, you're more likely to complete over 70% of your passes. Completion percentage is also a shaky stat because it doesn't account for passes that were dropped, passes that weren't thrown accurately and were still caught by receivers. And again, this would also consider tackles, quarterback hurries, drops. All of these things are subjective stats. So my issue at this point is that we see an overwhelming amount of people, uh, professionals, who are taking these subjective statistics, combining them with objective statistics, which is a pretty good way to do things, but they're using that and translating them into their own statistics. So when you see something like pass block win rate or a bad throw percentage or turnover worthy throw percentage, or when you see something like I wanna go into next, player grading, just know that those grades and those stats come from someone inferring that they know what was going on on that particular play and then inferring that they know what a win or what a loss is on that particular play. So PFF is very transparent with the way that they uh, measure their players. But one of the biggest things that you have to look at uh, is high validity. Is it valid? Is the test measuring what you're saying the test is measuring? Because every time that they give a player a grade, they're basically giving them a mini test. So is that grade a good representation of what's actually going on on the field? And that's the biggest thing. That's, that's what you want when you're grading anything, when you're assessing anything, that's what you want. So PFF, as I said, is very transparent. They give someone a grade from a negative two to a positive two, with negative two being a horrible, disastrous play, positive two being a game-changing great play, uh, zero just being they did exactly what they were supposed to do, nothing special. They didn't really hurt the team or help the team. And then one is probably just a good play. Negative one would be just a bad play, but not a, a disastrous play. So as you look at this document that I put together, uh, I, I kind of put out random numbers. Uh, a player plays 21 plays. Uh, they have mostly zeros, uh, one negative two, one negative one, uh, and a couple of twos and a one. So that will put them on that five point scale, that will put them at a 54 PFF grade, which means that this player pretty much did exactly what they were supposed to do pretty much the entire game. Uh, my thing is this, they have several plays where they did great. Uh, one play where they did good. Uh, one play where they had a bag play and one play where they had a horrible play. Uh, and then the rest were all pretty much average. A 54 by PFF on their scale is a bad grade. So a player doing what they're supposed to do, making one big mistake, one okay mistake, and then making several really great plays. I think, you know, the, the, that grading system is kind of flawed. It, it kind of brings you back to the point of this. It's just like a teacher giving you a zero, a 20, a 40, 60, 80, or a hundred. Uh, there are a ton of numbers in between those five numbers that I gave you and that kind of clouds things when PFF does this. Now, one thing that I will say is that PFF does give you, you know, play after play after play after play. Usually players are going to play more than 20 snaps and they're grading players over seasons, over years. So you would think that that would kind of average everything out, but it's still something to think about when it's on a five point scale. So when you're looking at a, a five point scale or what we call is a, is a liquor scale, uh, you actually have some strengths and some weaknesses to it. I'll start off with the strengths. One is that you're giving somebody a five point scale. So that's a lot better than did they pass this play or did they fail this play? Given a one or two answer or a you know zero and a five answer will be horrible because you will have people saying that this play was bad, this play was good, when it could just mostly most likely be in the middle. So that's the strength to that skill. 
Uh, and, and I think that's pretty much the only way you can do it because if you were to make uh, a 10 point scale, then you would have people who are, it, it's really hard to evaluate something on a 10 point scale, whether, you know, rather than evaluating on a five point scale. And then the weaknesses of a five point scale are that it only gives five to maybe seven options. So again, you're not going to have 10 options or 20 options, which can also be a downside, but you're not going to have all of the, 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 there's so much of a difference between zero and negative one. And then how can you be sure that that same difference for each evaluator will be between zero and negative one as it is between zero and one? It's really hard to, to pinpoint that on such a small scale. But again, I understand why you will pick that small scale. And you know, also you have a ton of different people that are using these grades. You have a ton of different people. Some people are more experienced. Some people are coaches, former coaches. Some people are former players, former scouts. You have really experienced people who really know what's going on. And then there's people who are just football enthusiasts. And then there are other people who really don't know much about football and they're all taught to grade on this five point scale. So one person's one might not be another person's one. One person's positive two might not be another person's positive two because you can watch two, you know, two people who are very experienced in the game and they feel like they saw two different things. It happens all the time. You see arguments on social media between people who are pretty much at the same knowledge level of, of the sport who saw things differently. So that's something that you also have to consider. Also, they do not consider uh, right here. They do not consider positional value. They do not account for positional value and they don't really account for how much that affects the uh, team winning or losing a game. So a receiver running two bad routes or, you know, two horrible routes doesn't really affect the game the same way that a quarterback throwing two picks, you know, affects that game. Uh, unless those routes cause interceptions. But these grades need to account for positional value. I think that is very important. And then it just, it goes up to this. How do you account for positional value? How do you adjust for how much more important each position is than another position? Which goes back to, can we really grade players? Can we really grade players? Because there's so much subjectivity. There's so many ways that you can look at it. So at the end of the day, analytics, stats, all of these extra numbers that you see in sports, they can be very helpful. They can be very helpful because they can tell you a good part of the story. But also you have to remember, numbers can tell any story that someone who's looking at them, someone who's putting them together, wants them to tell. They can tell any story you want. You can bend numbers whichever way you want. It's very easy to do. So. You always have to keep that in mind. But again, these numbers can be helpful. Consider the context in which they're used. And if it's something that's too good to be true, it usually is. Like if someone's the best in the league at just one thing, but that one thing isn't necessarily important, then it's not really a stat that that's, that's really needs to be used. Uh, if someone is the best quarterback when it's raining outside and it's 50 degrees and it's a home game, where the crowd is at 75% attendance, is that really a relevant stat? Just think about that, consider the context, consider the situation. And I just wanted to give you guys a new way to look at analytics, to look at statistics uh, when it comes to sports. So you guys let me know what you think of this video. If you wanna see more videos like this, I could go on, I can create an entire series like this. I can also do a series where I grade players on PFF's five point scale to see if I come up with similar kind of grades that PFF does. So you guys let me know. If you made it this deep into the video, come on, just hit the subscribe button. I make Giants content primarily, draft content secondarily. And during the season, I'm gonna be doing a lot of reacting to pretty much most of the NFL games and everything NFL. So if you made it this deep, go ahead and join the D6 squad.